Good afternoon, Excellencies, Senators, Parliamentarians, General and Flag Officers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, indeed a pleasure to be here as the moderator for this uh, panel this afternoon. Um, technology and naval operations, on the face of it, uh, a pretty obvious pairing for what is naval operations without technology. Um, and I don't say that just as an engineer. Historically, the Navy was one of the most technological of all the armed services, um, and in a number of cases, the incubator of marine technology generally. You think, uh, defining technology generally, naval medicine, screw propellers, steam turbines, reactors at sea, just to name a few, and you will have your own personal favorites. However, there's also the story of the Navy being technologically reactionary. We've all heard the jibe about a Navy being 300 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. And there are stories or interpretations of history that paint this picture also, although not quite so unambiguously. Retention of full rigs beyond the point of utility, low freeboard turret ship debates culminating in the HMS Captain tragedy, and even up to more recent times, the short fat ship controversy uh, in the wake of the Falkland Islands War. So while it is indisputable that there is a powerful relationship between technology and naval operations, the exact nature of this relationship is highly debatable. There's the technology push versus requirements pull debate on what actually is the impetus for advancement. Or one could question the very definition of technology. Are we talking only products of the engineering art or the developments of naval science generally? And even the question of where or whether there's actually a clear boundary between these domains. Are they in fact separable? It's accepted that the march of technology has been a march of ever-mounting expense, and so there's been a commensurate and consequential search for cost-saving paradigm shifts. Again, this is not a new phenomenon. We can think back to over a century ago, uh, the genicole of the small and fast many versus the battleships of the day. Uh, over the last three decades, uh, the doctrine or the uh, the concept of modularity has been under development and application from MECO uh, ships to LCS in more recent times. Um, but even considering the cost, we can go back to 1984 when a paper was published and the title was simply, Cheap Warships Are Not Simple. This recognition of the inescapable complexity, both of the design and procurement process, as well as of the end result in systems at sea, has also highlighted another concern, that of dependence on technology, with its intrinsic vulnerabilities of reliability, maintainability, but also of flexibility, or the lack thereof. Thus, there appears to be a natural and dynamic and trade space and tension between the development of product solutions, be they hardware or software, and the development of intellectual solutions in the sense of doctrines of naval operations. So in such a complex and close couple of questions as this, we are indeed fortunate to have a panel such as this to bring their significant expertise and experience to bear. Introducing them in the order in which they will speak, and I won't go uh, into this in great detail, you have the, uh, the detailed biographies in, in your uh, programs. Um, starting first, uh, Dr. Milan Vigo of the U.S. Naval War College will speak uh, with a bit of a scene setter. He has been the Professor of Operations in the Joint Military Operations Department of the U.S. Naval War College since 1991, uh, and I expect uh, was a professor to a number of those in the audience. Next, Dr. Tai Ming Chung from the University of California uh, will speak about one particular instance of, of development uh, and a context of development. Uh, Dr. Chung is the director of the University of California-wide Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation, and he's the leader of the IGCC's Minerva Project quote, the evolving relationship between technology and naval security in China, uh, which gives him a particular expertise to speak with. And finally, to bring up the, uh, the home lap, Rear Admiral James Jim Mur Murdoch, U.S. Navy retired. Uh, Jim works currently for Lockheed Martin um, and, and has a very varied uh, history uh, in the U.S. Navy, uh, but most particularly for our current purposes of discussion he was the program executive officer for the littoral combat ships, and so has a very personal experience of this trade-off between the naval operations and technology question. So without further ado, I will turn over the podium to Dr. Milan Vigo, who can be our first speaker. Dr. Vigo. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here. That's my first visit to Victoria, and I thank uh, uh, to the organizer to, for inviting me, and I hope I will deliver what they expect me to do. Uh, my topic is actually not controversial, I think, uh, and this is really more with a, uh, an overview, an overarching uh, uh, view of the influence of technology on various aspects of the naval warfare. Uh, so that's what I will try to uh, somehow cover. Each of these elements, is, I think they're known to you, but I think maybe there is some value or, or reminding us, you know, to which extent uh, technology is useful and to which extent your technology might be working against our own, you know, interests and so on. Uh, as you know, the war at sea and also in the air is generally much more affected by the technological advances than is war on land. The main reason is the characteristics of the physical medium in which naval platforms operate. The current of naval warfare is largely influenced by the several revolutionary and many evolutionary advances in the ship's propulsion, weapon sensors, and communications. But despite all its importance, the wars are won not by machines, but by the humans. And I think this needs to be always kept in mind. Experience shows that an overemphasis on technology or overestimating capabilities of advanced technologies invariably results in negative consequences on the development of naval theory, doctrine, and force planning. So task is to have, find a proper balance uh, between the material and the human factor. This graph shows the, uh, an overview of the evolution of warfare, uh, naval warfare, uh, based on the various naval uh, technological advances. And you can see the, the lines are progressively shorter as we went from uh, the era of oil and so, say, you know, sail to the computers because the time to adjust, adapt technologies were progressively reduced. Uh, in terms of importance, we all know that the combat potential of the Navy is to a greater degree dependent on the quality of its ships and weapons. That is more than the case in the, with the armies. In general, a Navy with a superior technology has greater chances of success than numerically stronger but technologically inferior opponent. A superior technology offers greater power projection capabilities in terms of speed, mobility, range, and endurance, and also higher effectiveness in combat like longer range detection, tracking range sensors, and long range, highly precise and lethal weapons. Uh, more advanced technologies can drastically reduce the need for large number of platforms and weapons. But there are also negative consequences. That means the, the new technologies are also much more costly, uh, and also that you need also much better trained and educated personnel. In terms of influences on the Technology, technology has influence on a number of the uh, various aspects of the uh, navies. One is the uh, components of military art. The technology affects tactics and operational art and strategy. These are three main components, but the, uh, clearly the influence is the greatest at tactical level because you're dealing with the platforms and weapons and sensors and so on. But uh, uh, that, that has to be kept in mind and kept to be also has to be understood that uh, the naval officers, naval commanders must actually properly evaluate in which way the new technologies affect tactics and then operational art and then also strategy. Uh, and then we have a character of war. We have a lot, sometimes a lot of confusion today because sometimes in terms of discussion it's said that new technologies are changing nature of war. Uh, what is, uh, we use the term nature and character, they're different. Nature of war, these with uh, these constants in warfare, which are timeless, they are not changing. And that's as Carl von Clausewitz explained to us, that means dominant role of policy and strategy. The war is always uh, a domain of the, you know, hatred, suf suffering, fear, chance, luck, fog of war, and friction, and also irrationality. So these things are always present in any war. Character of war is different because the character of war deals with the ephemeral, you know, the, those the things which are changing. And uh, one of the major influences on the character of war is, uh, sorry, okay. 
for this. That's a, what I already said, a character award, that's the uh, one attempt to define it because sometimes it's uh, not understood properly. And these are some of the main key factors which influence the change of character warfare. That means the drastic change in international security environment, uh, politics, demo demography, the changes of the character of war on land, and then also advances of science, technology, influence of theoreticians, you know, and also international law, law the army conflict. So this, but th 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 there was always shown in uh, uh, throughout the, the history that technology was one of the prime, really primary factors in changing the character. And then we have also changing methods of combat force employment. As you know, the forces can be used in conducting tactical actions, major naval operations, and campaigns. A major naval operation, for example, they, they emerged by the end of the 19th century, and the reason was, among others, was the you know, invention of the internal combustion engine, which then led you know, to proliferation of platforms, the quick firing guns, the mines, torpedoes. So the fleets progressively became much larger, and so it was not possible for any Navy to destroy the major part of the fleet in a single decisive battle. That means that means that need to be uh, integrated a series of smaller actions in order to achieve operational objectives at sea. Then we have also the, the certainly the naval, naval, I mean, technology influence also force planning, the ship design, the question also large versus small platforms, uh, the dual versus multi purpose platforms, and so on. We know today that the emphasis is on multi purpose platforms because this, this is much more efficient. But I think sometimes the designers, I'm not designer, but I think as operator, former operator, I think there is a going to extreme because what is efficient is not militarily effective. And that means when you have to make a choice, the most important thing is to be more effective and not just only efficient. Uh, in terms of naval theory, uh, as you know, that there is, a, I think, uh, that I think that's widely, I think, known that uh, most, many officers actually don't like theory. I think one reason why they think theory is too abstract is not useful. And uh, uh, the, all what they need is really to somehow have knowing your weapons, you know, platforms, you know, and just to operate. But the history also shows the lack of uh, theoretical knowledge, you know, or the warfare is in, as a whole makes extremely difficult, you know, to any officer, you know, to operate properly. The, the one of the major, I think, uh, uh, misconceptions of, of the theory, theory of warfare in general, or naval theory, is based on practical experience, on the practice of wars. Uh, it is not uh, like uh, when we uh, develop theory of mathematics or physics where you have a number of hypotheses and then you test them and then you, they become part of theory. Here we try to somehow find commonalities in various aspects of warfare, try to derive the lessons learned and then you know, a new theory of warfare, uh, naval warfare in, uh, emerge. Uh, that's what Clausewitz uh, reminds us on the, on the, on the value of the military theory in general. Okay. And the main components of the, uh, any sound theory is the, as I said, commonality derived from the study of past wars. That means historical perspective. And then another one is a vision of the future war at sea. That's a future. And that future is largely determined by technology. So th that's a role of technology. And that means it's based on current and projected uh, capabilities of the, of, of the various te technologies. We try to somehow uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, describe what will be a character of war in the future. But, uh, if you have uh, too much emphasis on, th on history, then, history, then the, the, the theory is di the disconnected from realities. Or if you have a, a, a theory which is totally based on unproven or new technologies, you have disconnect from the historical perspective. So in either way, you need to find some kind of, of balance you know, uh, between the two. And then we have uh, also the, the naval doctrine. As you know, naval doctrine sometimes is considered almost the same as a, theor as a naval theory, and they're not the same because the doctrine, one of the major inputs into doctrine is the, uh, the, the naval theory. And uh, doctrine always had many other, other inputs, you know, based on the, you know, the, the exercises, the maneuvers, you know, the weapons experiments and so on, and also new technologies. And doctrine serves, as you know, as a guideline for training. So there is a linkage between naval theory and, and doctrine. 
Okay, but they are not the same thing. And the reason for that, because naval doctrine is based on the uh, experience of single nation or single navy, and the naval theory is based on experience of all navies, so all, essentially all the wars in the, in the past. And uh, we, 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 I think the reason why we need to know theory, among others, is to, uh, once you know the theory, then you can actually, uh, uh, you know, more creatively apply the doctrine. And then we have a role of the, of the human factor, you know, that the, all the wars are fought with the humans. Success in a war between two strong opponents at sea cannot be ultimately achieved without superior leadership and high education, combat training, you know, combat motivation, unit, co unit cohesion. Uh, but we have now problems. Problems are, uh, as you know, not technology itself, but the way we perceive, you know, that means technology if you overemphasize technology or you exaggerate technology. Uh, so if you have an overemphasis on technology, you can have a, this uh, overly focus on material, uh, like was the situation in Dreadnought era, 1906, 1918, and then forgetting about historical, historical uh, experience. Uh, you have also influence on shape design, you know, okay. Sometimes you know the technology dictates or the, uh, the dictates the mission instead of just the opposite, and very often we have an inadequate study of the operating environment. And I would say that probably one of the examples in my mind is a littoral combat ship. I don't think that was done proper analysis of the operating environment which that uh, ship is going to operate. Uh, that's a dreadnought. Okay. This is also when you have a focus on the highly capable. Uh, platforms like a Japanese Navy in the interval years was an excellent tactical force, you know, but has many deficiencies because the, it was neglected the operational art and, and strategy. And then we have, uh, you know, one of the dangers of the focus on technology is focus on tactics, the you know, platforms, for neglect of the combined arms tactics, then also offensive warfare is overemphasized versus def so-called defensive aspects like ASW, mind warfare, okay. And then lack of operational thinking, that's like Imperial Japanese Navy, Western navies today, okay. This is all also very prevalent here, considering conduct of war or science and not uh, uh, as an art. Neglect of naval theory and also, we have unrealistic naval doctrine examples, you know, the French young school, Soviet young school, targeting approach today, okay assistance approach, okay. There are many things I think that we do today where technology is actually dictating uh, and I think is very unsound, okay. Okay, I think I'm done. And then we have also neglect of the human factor, okay. Always we have to remember that this is the material, is just a means and not the ends. Okay. And I think focus should be always on leadership at all levels and, and the war fighting, okay. And then we have also examples of the exaggerating importance, you know, that means in the past prediction, you know, predictions of the demise of the surface ships by the invention you know, of, the, of the mines, torpedoes, aircraft, you know, missiles. And then we have today by NSW advocates, you know, arguing that uh, information technologies can replace the numbers. And that's a highly unproven, I think. It is much better because it's very, very difficult to uh, uh, somehow quantify or to evaluate properly to which extent information dominance, for example, it can reduce the, the numbers. Uh, firepower mobility is much more tangible. And I think that's, a, that's a one of the reasons I think that we have a major problem with Blue Water Navy is you know, trying to reduce the numbers, which I think is uh, unproven and might actually be a, a source of major danger, okay? And then you have also, I think, uh, reliance of various unmanned vehicles, things that in my judgment that uh, many of them are not tested in pro properly in combat environment, and I don't think that uh, that needs to be some caution, that, that it's not a call that we don't need technology, but we need to also think you know, to avoid exaggerations, you know, and also uh, avoiding overemphasis, you know. And the human factor is always the main factor in the winning the wars. You know, there's no, uh, <coughs> so I will end here uh, because my time is up, okay? Thank <laughs> you.